because someone takes something special away from you that you believe obviously it's yours and it should be like a you know we all think that losing our virginity should be a magical moment when someone takes that away from you without actually um you know giving you consent what happened after that was i just lost all respect for myself and respect for my body so i started to um i started to date older guys um i started to think that only you know men would only like me if i kind of gave it out to him Hey beautiful souls, welcome to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. Today we have a very special guest with us, my best friend Haley Xenopontes. So, a bit about Haley. After experiencing a mental health breakdown 4 years ago after a series of unfortunate circumstances which led Haley to lose her home and business, Haley used volunteering and finding a network of people who could support her to get back on her feet. Haley has turned her life around and is now a proud owner of Zeno's Haven Hair and Beauty and Wellbeing Salon as well as being a dedicated mom to her 14-year-old son Marley. Haley runs a salon that employs several employees and acts as a focal point for beauty treatments as well as a venue for mindset coaching, meditation teachers, NHS nurses and lived experience individuals to help her beauty salon clients on their journey to recovery. Haley has personally used all the services on her own journey to recovery and is providing the pathway for others to follow. Let's have a chat with her. Hey Haley, how are you doing, lovely? Hi Madia. Yeah, I'm doing really good, you know. Proper excited about um being on your podcast today. Yeah, um it's it's an honor to have you like you're my best friend. You know, I I was thinking back when we actually met. We met like a, probably I think 2 years ago. um yeah. briefly at our friend James's party and then um that was just a brief and then we we kind of just circling around like in love attraction meet up and then and then we went for a walk last year actually during lockdown what well, actually we were out of lockdown <laughs> but yeah and then since then you've been my best friend you've been my rock you you that's you know you're so strong and your story is absolutely incredible you know when i first met you i did not know um that much about you you know i knew you but you didn't really we didn't talk about what you've been through it was only until like a couple of months ago you opened up and it was just incredible story um yeah. so i actually remember when we met each other at law of attraction and i actually felt the same way about you i remember thinking you know when you meet someone and you're like that person's going to be my friend for a very long time but listening to your story when we shared in the law of attraction group i was just like wow i'm blown away by you and i actually never thought like i don't know i just thought you were kind of like so far ahead of me that we'd never really like do you know what i mean and now we're just Really yeah, cool. you're you're kind of evolving like Jesus like I always say. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we're Jane our all of our journeys are different. No one's higher, no one's low. It's just uh depending where you are in your journey. I know all about you, Haley. Our listeners don't know. Uh so tell us a bit about yourself, a brief overview for our listeners. Me. So, um so yeah, as you all know, my name's Haley. and i run a hair and beauty salon but i also promote mental health and well-being around the stockport area so i've got a really strong passion about helping people um inspiring people and making people feel better um obviously as a hairdresser we naturally already have that talent but because of the challenges that i've been through in my life you know i feel like i've got lived experience now so i can kind of Yeah, just share my experience and and hopefully help others. Mhm. Yeah, that's such a like what you go through, you uh, you transform it to help other people. I think that's the greatest gift. So, going back to your childhood, what was your childhood like? How was your upbringing? Me when I was a child. Well, um Well, my granddad used to always have a caravan in Wales and we used to go there every single year. Um so I always remember like family holidays 
And I used to love being in front of the camera as well. So whenever my dad would get like the, the big massive camcorder out, I'd always be there like prancing up and down and being like a little bit of like, you know, like do, doing running commentaries and things like that. So I'd be like, right today, I'm up the great home and it's windy <laughs> and da, da, da. and it was like, yeah. So I've always had a little bit of a little bit of that in me, really. Mm. Um, so I think that's why I'm, I enjoy doing these podcasts. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, podcast and also you're an influencer, you know, your own social media influencing people and, you know, less brown type. So <laughs> which is good, you know, it was always in you. I'm aware that you were bullied in school. I mean, I was bullied in school as well. Um, can you tell us? about that what was going on there yeah um I think a lot of people go through bullying in school and you know I, I'm all about forgiveness and things like that because sometimes the person that's bullying you tends to be being either bullied themselves or they're going through something at home so looking back on it in retrospective now like I understand what that person was going through at the time um but no it's not nice at all I think in school I always wanted to fit in um and I remember one occasion, actually, I just had my nose, was it my nose? Yeah, I'd have my nose pierced. And um, I went to the park with all my friends and these three girls came over to me and they were like, oh, wow, I really like your nose piercing. Like, can we can we have a bit of a closer look? So I was like, oh, yeah, of course you can. But then as they all came over, like two of them pinned me down onto the floor um, and one of the girls started to put like slugs and snails and stuff in my mouth. And it was it was just a horrible experience. And um my two friends at the time obviously you want them to back you up but it's it's difficult when there's so many people on one person so um yeah that that kind of like it, it did traumatize me for for a couple of years really I mean I mean it would I mean uh you know sometimes they say that mental scars leave the you know I it's the strongest but like physical as well like you know if you have both then it's hard to get over and deal with especially in school because you know you're at an age where you want to fit in with people you want to be um you want to have did you have a lot of friends were you shy were you like what were you like as a child like yeah, I think I started off quite um, quite popular, really. Um, and I had my two best friends that we used to do everything together. Um, but then as the years went by, um, it was actually, it was one girl in particular, I kind of, she turned it around and, and said that I was basically bullying her when I wasn't. So everybody felt sorry for her. Mm. So it, it ended up being at one point, it was like half the year that were just against me. So I used to, I used to wake up in the mornings and just not want to go to school. Um, I used to try and finish school earlier so I could come home from school before the mad rush because there was one time where I was walking home from school and they all walked next to me and like bash, like, like hit into me and I fell over on like onto these shutters and stuff. And um, yeah, it, it was horrible actually, if you think about it. Um, so I think, yeah, I did start off in school quite um, confident and I used to want to do all like the, the shows and the acting and the dancing. But then over time, I do think I did start to lose more and more confidence with what I was going through. Yeah, I think, you know, um, going back when I was bullied in school, I was it was it wasn't physical, but it was more of a like a verbal um and I was completely the opposite. I had no friends. So, you know, like they were just constantly picking on me. But whereas you were, you were doing all these things like acting and maybe perhaps they were just a little bit jealous because, you know, it's um, that you're doing these things, amazing things. And, you know, sometimes when you're a light, uh, the darkness kind of lashes on to you. And, you know, it's not like you said before, it's, they're not bad people. You know, they're just going through with their own trauma. They're going through with their own internal conflicts. And you kind of just realize it afterwards, you know, like when you go through your own healing that they were like that because they were going through their own internal conflicts. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And what's yeah. crazy as well is the main person that it happened with, even when I started college, she came to college with me. We're still actually in touch nowadays. So it's like, yeah, it was strange, really. No matter how much I was getting bullied by these people, they still wanted to be in my life and they've still kind of can, like stayed in my life. So it might be a little bit what you're saying about maybe jealousy. I don't yeah. I don't know. It could I've be. never been a bully, so I can't really see things from their perspective, really. Mm. Yeah. Starting off, you know, getting bullied in school and, you know, you're starting to just you're starting to have a kind of a rough childhood, right? You know, um, obviously it's, it's for most people um, in school. But 
then around the age of 13 your life changed forever what happened yeah. to you um so when i turned uh yeah i was 13 years old um i actually started getting sexually abused um and that went on um on and off for around two years um so at the time yeah at the time you question yourself and you think like am i the one that's being like promiscuous is my you know is the skirt that i'm wearing is it maybe too short am i putting out the wrong vibe um and because at the time no one not many people knew about it but the people that did um it didn't really get stopped so i kind of went through the years thinking that maybe it was my fault and because the person that did it to me he was very manipulative mm -hmm. he told me that if i told anyone no one would believe me um he told me that my family wouldn't want to speak to me again if they knew about it so it's it is a it is a really strange one it was only actually recently a couple of years back that i realized what actually had happened to me was wrong and it had had like um a very negative effect on me mm, yeah because um i mean going through uh abuses it's you know i, I wouldn't want to wish it on anybody and you know and you do carry this to to your future like even your future romantic partners you know um did it impact your relationships um going forward it definitely yeah and even before that you know what happened was because because someone takes something special away from you that you believe obviously it's yours and it should be like a you know we all think that losing our virginity should be a magical moment when someone takes that away from you without actually um you know giving you consent what happened after that was i just lost all respect for myself and respect for my body so i started to um i started to date older guys um i started to think that only you know men would only like me if i kind of gave it out to him so it all became very very sexual from a very young age um even in school i was classed as easy everyone knew that you know Haley's the easy one because that's how i portrayed myself because you just i just thought well do you know what what's what's the point now like my body's my body's ruined basically so it, it can be anyone's um and then yeah then that snowballed like that effect um started to like kind of um kind of go into my relationships as well mm, yeah so did you notice this pattern while you were going through it obviously you weren't you were you probably were aware of it but you i know you're doing all the work now you know knowing you personally you're doing the amazing work like on yourself right now when you were going through it were you a little bit aware of like oh this could be because of this this happened to me no definitely not no, no. at that no. time you, you know you just you just think that's you and you just think that's what you do and mm. you're so in it that you don't really yeah it's only been like i said recent years where i've gone back into doing like inner child work and all that kind of stuff where i've, I've really thought you know what that was that was definitely wrong what happened Mm. what was the inner child work that you were doing um i did some ifs therapy with um, a guy called james potts oh yeah yeah, yeah. I, I i had him on my podcast and he's, he's incredible he's incredible um i had the therapy session with him as well yeah um now you gave birth to a beautiful uh, soul marley uh, at the age of 19 um and you suffered from postnatal depression afterwards uh can you tell us about that yeah um so obviously um well i conceived marley on my 18th birthday in blackpool <laughs> <laughs> Classic. and i've still got the little business card of the hotel that i was in you know um, i do i was just very young at that point and I think the postnatal depression came because I was such of a young age. Mm. So when all my friends were going out partying or they were going traveling around the world when they finished school, I was kind of settled by that point. So I'd moved in with Marley's dad. He was going to work every day. I was, um, and actually uh, a month after Marley was born, uh, our house got burgled. Mm. So I, I already felt kind of, you know, you feel a bit anxious being in a house on your own anyway. And then with having like a young child um yeah so i, I suffered really bad postnatal depression um i remember a, a one day actually when um his dad used to come home and i literally would hand marley to him run out the front door with no shoes on and just run into the nearest field because i just needed like it was like a natural instinct like i needed to get away 
um yeah it was it was hard yeah yeah how long was was this for yeah it went on for a while actually um it got that bad that i actually when he used to get up in the morning to leave for work i would get marley up at six in the morning and i'd go and spend the day with my mum because mm -hmm. i just couldn't cope mm -hmm. and i'd hand marley to my mum and i'd just spend all day in bed oh wow um so did you not get any help from anyone um like mm. I didn't know it was postnatal depression back then. I think now it's kind of spoke about a lot more. Yeah. But at the time, I think because I was just so young, I think I'd do things a lot more differently now. If I had another baby at like 34, I know there's a lot more awareness out there. Mm. But at 18, 19, you, ju you just live through it and you just get on with it. Yeah, I think many, probably many of uh, our listeners who might have been in the same situation, you know, they, you, you kind of just think um it's just the depression and i'm not fit enough i'm not good enough for to be a mother or things like that but then uh, you kind of realize later on it's like oh okay i was actually going through postnatal depression you know uh but when you're going through it you have no idea and as well it didn't really help our relationship because he was at work all day and then when he'd come home from work because i've been on my own he might just want to nip out and see his friend for an hour for like a drink or something mm -hmm. and i wouldn't want him to leave the house so he'd, he'd leave the house and I'd just be in fits of like tears and, and proper having panic attacks because mm. I was just like, don't leave me again. Do you know, it was just a very lonely period, I think. Yeah. Spent my days watching Jeremy Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> how, was, how was the relationship like with your uh, partner at the time then? Um, well, he was, he was a bit older, older than we were when we met. Yeah. Um, and he was, he was amazing with Marley. Um, he really, really was. But we just kind of outgrew each other. Hmm. So, yeah, I just had this deeper knowing that I wanted more than that. And I just felt very trapped. I know it sounds awful to admit now, and I've even had conversations with Marley, but at the time, I found it hard to bond. I really struggled with bonding with Marley, um, being so young. And I just wanted to be free. I wanted to go out. I wanted to see my friends. I was 19 years old. And, hmm. yeah, looking back now, it's the best thing I ever did, but at the time. So then you have you have feelings of guilt as well. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's kind of like uh, perhaps like the pattern that you were saying that you were going after all the men, you know, after after your abuse. And it was just a pattern. It was almost like um, all these men that were coming into your life were like layers and you were like just peeling all the layer. But you, maybe you weren't conscious of it at that time, but you were peeling all the layers and layers and layers until now. I know you now, the work that you do now on yourself, you have boundaries, you are set on what you want and you're a totally different person to the, the way you describe now. And it's 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 beautiful to see because you know it gives people hope it gives people um young women or if they're going through the same thing it gives them hope as well that you know you can uh, uh potentially break out of these patterns and thoughts and and be uh, a living legend basically <laughs> you know you know what though i don't think it happens overnight as well because we see transformations in people and we think oh like how have they done that but honestly i've done it where i've been like one step forward two steps back because mm. those patterns are so ingrained in you mm. um do you know what i mean there's been many times where i thought i'm moving forward and then something's happened so it, it has it's taken a it's taken a lot of work yeah it's 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 the peeling of the uh, onion basically it's it you constantly do it and it's like sometimes it's one onion sometimes it's 10 onions it's like oh my god <laughs> yeah um well, do you know what? i see everything as like a teacher now everything that's happened in my life up to here it, it's been a lesson and everyone that's come into my life they've been like my greatest teacher mm. so you know the universe works in mysterious ways doesn't it so everything is how it's meant to be yeah the way i see relationships now is um they're either a preparation or the right person so if they are not um if there's nothing happening there or something happened or whatever they're they were a preparation and if you look at it as as that way then that's one step closer to the right person that you're meant to be with you know definitely yeah. I would say one thing as well, actually, which, um, it's about boundaries. So I'm still reading a book about boundaries at the moment. And I always have to, I've had, um, I did some therapy last year with a, with a coach that helped me with boundaries. And I think that is the one thing, if anyone uh, who's watching has been through um, abuse or anything like that, 
then I think boundaries is one of the hardest things to get over. Um, and it is a daily practice. Um, you find it very, very hard to say no to things because you become um, a little bit like a people pleaser um, and you want to be liked. Um, definitely if you've been through bullying or any kind of physical, mental abuse, I just think that boundaries is, is really important to get your head around. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Boundaries, is any, especially if, if you're a sensitive empath, you know, um, empaths do um, like boundaries. And especially if you go through a trauma at an early age, that's like a dense emotion, dense feelings, you know. So what you, happens is oftentimes when something happens, you suppress it and like you kind of detach from your body. You detach from your body and go in your head, you know. Um, so yeah, it's so, so important to work on yourself. And um, and I guess it's, it's, it's realizing um, you can see the person's trauma, you can see the person's patterns, but then you have to leave them to it. You know, if you come across anyone, your friend or family member, you have to leave them to it because it's their journey, it's their life. And, um, you know, they, they come to their own realization when it's the right time for them. Yeah. Um, so now we know, like, you've been through so much from a young age, you know, um, I, I it's like oh there's so much happened to you from young age it's like uh, how are you still standing <laughs> sort of thing you know uh but it shows you're resilient you're strong character and you know it doesn't end there around the age of 25 you had a devastating uh, news about your dad mm. can you tell us about that yeah um so my well growing up my dad is greek greek cypriot um, and I've got um, a brother and sister and some half half brothers. I think it's six of us all together. Um, and I have always felt a little bit like, how come they all look really Greek and I don't? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, what happened when I was 25, um, I found an email um, and I found out that my real, well, my dad that I've obviously known for like 30 odd years um, wasn't actually my real dad. Um and I kind of read it through an email and at the time I was I was absolutely devastated because me and my dad are really really close mm. um and then I rang my mum up and I said to my mum I just came out of it I was like mum is is dad not my real dad and she just started crying her eyes out and I was like oh my god like this is this is crazy and she basically said the reason, I mean, they'd only been apart for about a year uh, when my mum had met somebody else when they were having um, problems and stuff. Um, but then they got back together again. And my mum said, we just made the decision between us not to um, not to tell you about it because we didn't want you to feel like you weren't part of the family. So looking at it now, you know, I understand that they were just trying to protect me. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, I was just so angry because I thought, what about my real dad? And, and what about all these... 20, 30 odd years that I've lost with my actual real dad. Um, and at the time, um, my Greek dad, um, it's a bit confusing. He was so angry that I'd read his email that he come running around to my sister's house and there was a gate in between us. And he started screaming like, you've been looking on my computer and through my emails. And I just started crying my eyes out. And I said, I can't believe you're not my real dad. And I think him seeing my emotion it just like he broke down, I broke down um, and it devastated him because my mum said he's all, even though he's not your real dad, he's always had that special place for you and he's always treated you as if he was your own. Um, and then I met up with my real dad and we tried, we did try to bond and stuff, but it just, it had been too many years and he didn't know me well enough and he was trying to re- uh, relive my young mo like he was like let's go for an ice cream or let's go for a walk or let's and I just wasn't just could not make that connection with him um and then my other dad when I got the salon and started doing all the salon up and everything he was there for me every day he was he worked as a builder from like six in the morning till six at night and straight after it he'd come straight to my salon help me decorate he's always been there for me no matter what and actually it's it's made our relationship so much stronger now and we're so much closer mm -hmm. um yeah. which is which is beautiful to see because you know it shows that blood doesn't make you family you know yeah. you know mm -hmm. and uh we make connections on a soul level 
and it, the fact that you and your dad is um you have a, such a beautiful bond even when you found out even when you know all of this news was going around you still you're still family you still you still have that beautiful bond so you know if any of our listeners are going through the same situation right now with their mom or dad what would you tell them i'd say it's really important um to try and have an open conversation with them and it's not easy because guy, you know men find it very hard to open up um even if it's through a letter or a text message or something i literally sent my dad a text saying you know what dad like i absolutely love you so much and i wouldn't change anything and mm. I'm just so grateful, you know, what, what everything that you've done for me, because yeah, even that, and it made him so happy. Um, so yeah, I think communication is really important. Um, yeah. Communication and feeling your feelings and emotions, you know, because they're up in the air at this point and you are struggling with it. And it's, it's wise to just sit down with your parents and discuss it, um, discuss what's been going on in your head. Um, so like you said, communication, honesty, and even if you can't find yourself to be in the same room or if there's something else going on, you know, um, try and take a space for yourself and process it. Well, speak to someone else, speak to a close friend. It doesn't yeah. have to be parents, maybe get a little bit of um, a different perspective on things and mm. just maybe speak to someone that, that you're close to. Yeah. So um, I've known you for two years. Obviously, I didn't know about your story up until um, recently. Um, but what most um, got me was your mental breakdown. Because to me, when I look at you, you're strong, you're resilient, you're bubbly, you're funny. And there's so much life energy in you. I would have never thought that you had a mental breakdown. And you also suffer from severe anxiety and depression. So can you tell us about that? Yeah. I mean, they always say the happiest people, aren't they? They're always hiding something. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think for anyone, there comes a point where you get to breaking point. Mm. And I had taken a lot, a lot of things on in my life up to the age of about 30. Um, and then I got to a point where I was in quite um, a, like an emotionally abusive relationship. Um, I also had a business that I opened up with my best friend at the time, a hair and beauty salon. And I just moved into this house as well, which was absolutely beautiful. It was um, it was a house in Didsbury. Mm. And in the space of one month, um, I lost my business. Um, I had a relationship breakdown and I lost my house. So all those things wrapped in one um, kind of led me to have a breakdown everything that you packed in your life I think you were kind of running away from feeling it right you were running away from everything I mean like I said you know when you're an empath and you're getting hit by life uh, struggles over and over again what happens is you just suppress everything and then they, there comes a point where your bottle is full and it needs to explode out. And I guess that's what uh, was happening there. What was going through your head at that time? Yeah, so obviously at the time as well, I think when you explore it and we start, I started to have counseling and things like that, I realized that they were just situational things. Mm -hmm. uh, once we started to dig deeper, that's when I started to get the realization that it was obviously linked to what I'd been through as a child um, and the bullying and things like that. Um, so basically I was just doing hair one day and I was in between cutting this girl's hair and I felt really dizzy um, mm. and then I passed out and I didn't know what was wrong with me um, and then I rang my mum and literally after that I ended up being bed bound for about two months. I couldn't physically like lift my head off the pillow. It was very physical um, and I think it's because it was it was due to boundaries. All of this has been due to boundaries. You know, you have people have done things to me in my life and my answer has always been because I'm quite positive oh it's fine it's okay you know and and it's fine it's fine and and you know um and then that's the point where literally your body just goes I can't take this anymore I'm just mm -hmm. they say don't they like depressed is deep rest 
And for me, it was my body just shut down and said, I can't keep pretending be it. I can't keep pretending to be this person anymore with a smile on her face when she's got so many things going on. Mm. Um, were you were you like suicidal um, at that point? Yeah, I was very suicidal. I've uh, been to the doctors. They put me on a high dose of propanol and antidepressants. Mm. And at the time, I didn't realize, but, you know, that was even creating kind of, I believe it was creating kind of suicidal um, tendencies and stuff. So, yeah, I, I, looking back, I feel so sorry for my mum and dad because they had to keep me safe and we didn't really have much support at the time. So, you know, every day I'd wake up and I'd be sat there next to my dad and I'd say, I just don't want to be here anymore. I'm going to kill myself in a minute. And literally he had to make sure the front door was locked because if it wasn't, I kept trying to run out in front of a bus. Mm. Um, they had to hide all the knives out of the drawers because I kept trying to get the knives Um then I'd disappear off. There'd be times where I'd finish work and I would just disappear. Like, I think I drove to Salford Keys one time, um, sent a message to all my friends saying that um, that I'd had enough, basically. Said goodbye to everyone and I just turned my phone off. Mm. Um, yeah, because I, at the time, you feel like you're a massive burden to people. And at the time, you feel like you're bringing everybody down and that everybody would be better off without you. Even my own son, like people think, oh, isn't it everyone? Well, my sister kept saying to me, you know, don't you think it's a bit selfish to not want to be here anymore when you've got Marley to look after? Mm. And I was like, yeah, but he'd be better off without me. Like I am absolutely no use right now. Mm. Um, so like, you know, if people are going through this right now, you know, um, I mean, feelings of suicide. I, when I was going through my own hell, I felt like that as well for numerous of times. I didn't like, you know, there was the times where I would get my hand out and like my mom had quite, my mom was ill so that I would, I would put all the pills in, in my hand and I would just look at them, you know? So thinking that if I take these pills, it would be so much easier. But there was that intuition, your guide, your soul, something was pulling me back away from it. Um, so if someone is going through this right now, what would you tell them? Definitely speak to someone, speak to anybody, like you're not a burden on anyone. And you know what, you're not alone because there's so many people going through this right now. And you might think you're the only person and you know, but it's, it's a lot more common than you realize. So, you know, you mentioned that you went down the route of like antidepressants and everything. Um, now, you know, to extreme cases, antidepressants help, you know. Um, but uh, what I find is that it just numbs the pain. It just numbs the, the, you're not really getting to the root of the problem. So you were on antidepressants for quite a, uh, for a while. And when you came off them, what were you, what was the work that you were doing on yourself? Yeah, so I knew as well, because when I was starting to to get better with it, I actually went to Croatia for my best friend's wedding. Mm -hmm. And that gave me that focus to keep going because I was a bridesmaid at a wedding. So I knew I had to be there. So even though I was going through awful depression, you know, in the morning, like my mum would wake up and she'd get me dressed and Marley would be like, come on, mum, like do your teeth. And, you know, they had to get me out of bed. And as soon as I got my day going, I was all right throughout the day. I had to just keep distracted and stuff. Um, but then when I started to want to feel better, so I started to try and do things that would help like exercise or, you know, do things that normally make you smile, like, you know, listen to music. Mm. The antidepressants were actually numbing any kind of emotion. So I couldn't feel highs and I couldn't feel lows. I was just feeling very, very numb. Mm. And the propanol as well was, uh, when I was trying to work out, I couldn't, it was preventing me from breathing properly. Um, this is just my experience. So in the end, what I did is, I just knew that it had to be me. I knew that I'd tried every avenue to help me to feel better. And in the end, I realized, actually, I've got to stand up and I'm the only person that can change this. Yeah. So I started to look into loads of natural, natural ways of getting better. Um, every morning when I drive my son to school, I'd treat my car as a learning, a learning zone. So as soon as I got in the car, I'd put positive affirmations into my ears and I'd just repeat them constantly. Um, I knew that I had to start rewiring the way that I was thinking about things because it's like a switch had gone off and I'd just gone very, very negative. So I started to do that. 
Um, and you know what? It was just one step at a time. It wasn't a million things in one go. If I literally one day, you know, I got up and had a shower, then that was actually a win. Mm. Um, if I got up and went for a 15 minute walk, that, that made me feel better. So it was very, very small steps because sometimes when you're in that place, you feel as though it's just looking at each minute of getting through the day. What mm. can you do in that moment to get you through the next hour? Yeah, so. and it's it is so Molly came sort of became your carer, young carer at the point, right? So that's uh, how 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 was he feeling about the whole situation? I think he was kind of young enough to not notice in depth what was happening, um, but he was also my anchor because I had to make sure I got to a point where I had to make sure I'd take him to school every day, um, and my friend actually she was amazing. She'd get me up in the morning. She'd have these this punch bag and she'd be like, right, I want you to like do some some boxing. And for some reason, it just kind of like, I don't know what it did to me, but it it, it just like really helped me to release like endorphins and stuff. Mm -hmm. And she'd be like, right, you've got to get him to school. So put a face on, get him to school, kind of fake it till you make it. And then I knew that then at three o'clock I had to go back and pick him back up again. So I think as well with my mum at first, your family want a mully cuddle you. And they want to say, do you know what? I'll take him to school. You just relax in bed. But that doesn't help. It actually mm -hmm. helps more to get up, put your makeup on, do your hair, get them to school, fake it till you make it. Honest to God, like I would feel dreadful inside, but I had to put a smile on my face and get Marley to school. Mm -hmm. So that was my main focus. Yeah. Um, I think um, one of the key points is just feeling your emotions. Like I keep going back to it, you know, um, when you're going through darkness it's the uh you need to go through them you know if you look back and so many people who've come out of adversities and dark night of the souls and you know depression they look back and they they are grateful i'm certainly i'm grateful for it and i'm sure you are as well you know grateful for all these experiences because it's kind of most people don't realize when you are in darkness that's when you are growing the most that's when you're expanding the most but we don't real realize it because it's called growing pains and it's growing pains for a reason right um so um and Mali is is such a an incredible soul uh, he is absolutely amazing i mean he's wise so wise for his age i mean <laughs> he's an amazing amazing kid i think as well with Mali, um he has he's, he's so kind of empathetic now and he's got such a lovely heart because one of the main things we did as well i started reading a book and it was called feel the fear do it anyway by suzanne jeffers amazing book that literally like changed my life um and that talked a lot about contribution how to get out of your own head and do something for the greater good so what me and marley would do at the weekends when i wasn't well um we drive to manchester and we'd do like the soup kitchen so we'd feed like the homeless we'd take clothes there mm -hmm. um we'd take any books for the children that marley had that he wasn't reading anymore and just doing those kind of things with marley you know what, like, I think as well, a lot of people think I don't want my child to see me when I'm down. I don't want my child to see me cry. And you know what? It's actually really important that they see those things because it'll yeah, mold them and it'll make them realize that everything isn't isn't love and light all the time and it'll give them a little bit of resilience as well yeah yeah and it gives it a the vulnerability you have to show the kid how to be vulnerable because in in our society uh most people like you said it's like they're hurting inside but they have a shield up it's like and that's what we're teaching kids as well we're teaching them how to shield and not not go inside and be vulnerable yeah i think there's definitely a time and place like you say about obviously always feeling your emotions and all that. And I think that's really, really important. Um, but I used to also get into like very obsessive thought loops where mm -hmm. I would be sitting there all day and I'd, I'd kind of be with my emotions for too long. Mm -hmm. So as well, I think um, when I was getting better, I started to do a little bit of voluntary work in a mental health cafe. And that was a healthy distraction because I was yeah. helping other people. I was, you know, I think if you spend too much time on your own, 
sometimes it can be bad for you as well so it's about finding that balance, balance. of yeah it's what... distractions to get out of your head but then also feeling your emotions as well yeah so it's 50 50 50 percent external and 50 percent internal and like i don't mean external is go out partying and clubbing external like what you were doing volunteering and you're helping the homeless you were using your pain as a power to help those people and that is the most powerful thing there is you know is it les brown is it les brown that says it he says like your greatest your greatest wound will be become your greatest power and i really believe that and you know what i tap into that even now they say that like anger and all that is actually it's it's the the best emotion that you can use for taking action Mm -hmm. um and now I use that I'll go back to different memories and I'll really kind of feel it and I'll use that to propel me forward mm -hmm. even with like you know things like fitness if I'm trying to try do like 10 more press-ups and I haven't got it in me I'll feel like bring all them emotions up and I'll just like yeah. use them emotions in a healthy way it's a beautiful way to um uh, look at it also like when we went to we went to one of the hikes and we and that's another thing if people are feeling angry we <laughs> we were literally in the middle of nowhere we decided to scream <laughs> that, that was that was incredible that was incredible and that's that's another way you can there are healthy ways to let your anger out your frustrations out you know you know, I always believe that your breakdown is a breakthrough in life. So do you believe that this was the turning point uh, that led you on a path of transformation? Yeah, 100%. Mm. Absolutely. Um, as well now, because now I, I've actually rebuilt a salon. So I've got my own hair salon now. But because it promotes well-being and mental health, I would never have had that before. Um you know, and I really support women that want to come into a salon who, you know, they might be feeling anxious or a little bit down. So I kind of really make it really comfortable place for them to come to be able to express, you know, how they're feeling at the time. And when they leave, hopefully I can help them to feel a little bit more lifted. Hmm. So, yeah, it's been, yeah. It's been a positive yeah so speaking of your uh salon so you have your salons called a xenos haven hair and beauty salon right um so it's not just an, a salon like you just said it's a well-being center as well so what sort of things were you, are you doing in uh the well-being center yeah so we obviously we do the hair and the beauty and then we offer days out to clients where if you I did a little bit of a survey and it was really interesting the amount of women that say when they're getting their hair colored or cut they don't like to sit and stare at themselves in the mirror all day mm. so we created this no mirror day where you can come in get your hair done um and there's no mirrors in the salon wow um, yeah, yeah that was really really popular and then we also have the silent chair day as well so if you feel like you're coming into the salon you've had a really hectic day and you don't really want to talk to anyone you just want to relax and unwind um then we also have the silent chair so after the initial consultation we'll just leave you to relax we'll give you a, maybe a book or an mp um play away you can listen to relaxing music and you don't have to feel like the need to speak yeah you also do meditations uh, and things like that in your garden and as well i think you just recently done your garden yeah, so it's really exciting this week, actually. I've had an email back saying that um, we're going to have a project um, where we're going to be helping people, uh, the elderly, um, who haven't been obviously getting outside in the past few months. So they're going to be using the space that I've created outside to do um, art therapies, um, grow fruit and veg. Um, mm -hmm. And then obviously when the space is finished, we're going to be teaching meditation, yoga, um, gong bath, sound healing, so yeah, it's really exciting. Amazing, amazing. You know, like to think that what you've been through, you're still going, you're resilient and you're making a huge difference, you know, uh, in people's lives. It's, it's incredible to see and it's, it's amazing to see you grow. So what are the workshops that you do at your wellbeing center? Yeah, so we do loads of different types of workshops. Um, obviously at the moment we've moved them online. But we um, we focus a lot around self image, self confidence, um, helping women to to raise their self esteem, because um, that's all the things that I've had to do um, moving forward in my journey. Mm. And obviously, with lived experience, I feel as though, you know, it your past doesn't define you. 
and it doesn't matter what you've been through or you know what people have done to you at the end of the day like there's nobody that that should be able to tell you that you can't do something Mm -hmm. so yeah I'm really really passionate about helping women to um grow to empower other women um and yeah just just to to know that you can be successful no matter what you've been through Mm, that is beautiful really really beautiful so this is the work that you're going to be moving forward with uh on you know what's next for you wow i want to do everything i want to do everything (laughs) i know you i know you (laughs) You literally want to you dive into everything (laughs) like i'm just expanding at the moment so um you know since with the salons not been open for a couple of months i've been doing a lot of well-being products um and also what i really want to do is i live above the salon at the moment mm. so i'm looking to hopefully by next year move out of the salon move out from upstairs get me and marley our own our own home mm. and i want to turn upstairs into more kind of like counseling rooms mm. because you know counseling helped me a lot uh counseling cbt um, different therapies so I want to be able to have um, a space where my clients can come to and be able to you know speak to someone yeah that is amazing because like you know CBT counseling and also IFS you know all these things you know if you can implement if you can make it into a service for other people to you know to uh, tap into that's beautiful you know that's beautiful work because you know we often think that success is some big thing you know like it is in most cases you know but you know the most important thing is that success is when you help people to uh, heal past that trauma you know, if you help people, even if you're just a gateway for them, or you, even if you're planting a seed, um, yeah. which is beautiful. And these, like, I'm, I absolutely, absolutely love your well-being center, and you know, I, I think it will do amazingly well, um, because I know you, you, I know you, you are very driven, you are very, uh, very strong. So I know it will do well. Now, I want to talk about this award that you got. <laughs> I love this. Um, so you won OSBA People's Turnaround Award last year. Congratulations. Okay. <laughs> so how did that come about? Yeah. So the, the mental health cafe next door, the Bubble Enterprise Cafe, when I did some voluntary work in there, um, they actually helped me to get a grant um, off the startup government to open my salon up um and then they actually put me forward for an award which is um I think I was up against four or five different people Mm. and it's about the person who has managed to turn a life around um and has played like an active role in the community Mm. so yeah I couldn't believe it so they put me forward for it um and I won and I was amazing that's incredible it just shows this is just the beginning this is only the beginning I mean you don't go through hell to for nothing you know you know later on in your life you're going to be doing amazing things I have no doubt but this award just is perfect is you know it's perfect for you so Hayley um we're coming to an end um uh, to this interview I really don't want it to end because you know we could just sit here and talk for hours and hours and hours um but um before we leave um I want to go through rapid fire questions with you uh I grill every single person <laughs> so you're one of them you're my best friend I want to, you know I gotta <laughs> <grill>. <laughs> all right cool are you ready yeah <laughs> <laughs> well you have to be you have to go through them <laughs> you cannot leave without it okay so what is your definition of god of god i feel like god's inside of us i feel like we are god i feel like you know yeah that's that's why i think we are god <laughs> you, you are the source of god. <laughs> it's perfect it's perfect through us we do god's work and we serve we serve god and we channel it through us that's what yeah. i believe Absolutely. What do you think happens when you die? Wow. Uh, I think that you, um, I don't know. I, I'm very magical. I do think that there's a heaven and you go up there and you have an amazing, amazing party with you, with your family. <laughs> <That's what laughs> yeah. I, um, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. I know there's, I know there's something more to life than, than what there is yeah. now, but I don't yeah. know if, humans know the answer 
Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll find out when we die, right? Um, how do you define religion and spirituality? You know, I think it's it, it it's all down to the individual. I think it's really, really healthy for each person to have something that they can believe in, um, whether it is religion or spirituality, no matter what it is. Um, if you have that, that you can kind of tap into every morning or every night and it works for you, mm. then I think it's, it's a really, really healthy thing. Yeah, beautiful. What's the lesson that took you longest to learn? Boundaries. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> learning to say no, learning to put myself first and prioritize and realize that, you know, not everybody's, you know, not everybody's going to like, I don't what know, do? not everyone's going to like, you, you, you feel like you want to be liked by everyone, don't you? Mm. And I think sometimes you, you have to put yourself first. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. Um, Okay, so I'm fully in present moment when? Oh, well, I play in a Caribbean steel orchestra. Oh, well, so when okay. I'm playing on that bass and I'm dancing to Bob Marley, you know, and uh, yeah, that is when I'm in my, my present moment. Yeah, brilliant. Do you believe there is an end to healing? Hmm. Like I used to go for a point of always thinking I need to fix myself all the time. And then James Potts actually said, it's not about fixing yourself. It's about evolving. Mm. So I do believe that I have, you know, I've healed a lot of things. Um, but also it's the change of perspective now, the way that I look at my past. Mm. So I don't see it as I still need to heal. Mm. I just see that I'm on a path of like evolving now. Mm. Beautiful. You're evolving uh, faster than Jesus. Just have to say it. That's the thing that we I said to her, guys. If you don't know, <laughs> if you don't know, she was like, oh, my God, buddy, I'm going so fast. I was like, you're evolving faster than Jesus. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> That's going to be our little quote now, isn't it? That's going to be our little quote. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Um, so uh, one last one. The world needs more of what? More love. Mm. the world needs more love like you know if you realize things are kind of triggering you in life and things like that just just give love to everyone and everything and realize that we're all the same we're all one and at the end of the day you know someone if if someone's getting you upset or getting you annoyed then they're just probably coming from a place of suffering themselves mm. so have kindness have compassion have love Surround yourself with amazing, amazing, beautiful people like Madia. Um, <laughs> and just just really encourage everyone to grow. And yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So the, the people that you surround yourself with is so, so important. What is the one message that you would like to share with someone who is going through adversity or going through a dark night of soul, spiritual awakening, they're lost in life? What would you tell them? I just tell them to keep going don't ever quit, just keep going, no matter how hard it gets, you've got to just dig deep and just put one foot in the front of the other and just get through that next hour or so, because I guarantee you, whatever you're going through, it'll pass, nothing in life stays the same, hmm. do you know what I mean, even in the darkest place, the darkest hour, you know what I mean, that that will pass. Um, yeah, yeah, it will, it will, certainly will. So how can people contact you? So, um, yeah, if I'm, I've got Instagram. So if you want to um, directly message me, it's Hayley Zenofonta. And um, if you want to contact my salon, it's Zeno's Haven. So Zeno's is obviously because of my dad, my, my Greek dad. And then Haven is because it's like a sanctuary. Mm -hmm. So uh, at Zeno's Haven. And you can find me on Facebook or Instagram. Brilliant. Awesome. It was so amazing interviewing you, Hayley. I mean... You know, your stories of transformation is incredible. And I'm so grateful that you, you came on this podcast and shared this story with us. Um, I know there's so many amazing things that are coming your way and what you do for other people as well. I know you, you know, you're, you give so much to the community. You give so much love to everyone else. You're always caring about other people and you lift everyone's uh, vibration, including mine. I'm so grateful to have you as a friend and you, you've been my rock over the last year or so, you know. Um, so is there any last message that you would like to say? 
I just want to say thank you. Thank you for letting me come onto your platform today and really share uh, my story. I think it's really important that we realize how powerful our stories can be, you know, um, because there might just be one person out there that's resonated with me today that I can help. And if I've helped to just inspire one person, you know, every single person here is unique and special, you know, and you all deserve the very best. Um, so, yeah, I would just say that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. Love you too. Thank you so much for listening to Soul Awakenings with Madia Sosan podcast. I would love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. Share your thoughts on my Facebook and Instagram, Madia Sosan. You can also check out my website, madiasosan.com. If you would like to watch this episode, then head over to my YouTube channel, Mads Corner, M-A-D-Z Corner. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends. Thank you once again, and I will see you on the next episode.